Global Programs. My name is Stephanie and I'll be today's moderator. Today's webinar will guide you on how to hold a fundraiser or event as a fiscally sponsored program of UCP. But before we get started, I'd like to go over a few webinar housekeeping items. All attendees at this webinar will be muted. If you have any questions, simply type them into the comment or question field uh, located on the control panel to the right of your screen. We will then take some time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you have. All right, today's webinar, a guide to hosting an event or fundraiser, will be presented by Katie Kern, UCP's Director of Program Administration. During this one-hour presentation, we will guide you through UCP's event and fundraising requirements and policy, as well as tips on hosting your next su successful event. Now let's welcome Katie. Katie? Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Like Stephanie said, I am the Director of Program Administration. I'm also going to be your main point of contact in addition to Mary and Hauk with any questions or concerns with your disbursement forms, your event fundraisers, your travel, all that good stuff that you do as an active charitable program underneath UCP. So let's go ahead and dive on in. We're going to talk about how to hold a fundraiser or an event underneath UCP. But before we get started, I do want to remind everyone that we have a great program operational manual. It's available on our website underneath the unitedcp.org um, fiscal sponsorship tab. It's there with the agreement as well as our application. And if you have not yet done so, you do need to send in that signed fiscal sponsorship agreement. We do need to have that on file before your program can stop, start operating. And on a side note, our annual report for 2013, excuse me, annual activity report for 2013 was due yesterday. So if you haven't sent that in, please make sure you do so. If you have any questions or concerns about uh, the, in, the operations manual or that agreement or really anything on our website, you can contact us at unitedcp.org, excuse me, info at unitedcp.org, or our number is 703-536-8708. And I'll give you my direct contact information, my email, and my phone number at the end of the presentation. So a few things that we're going to go over, the benefits of having a fundraiser, uh, the policies and good practices, policies both from UCP as well as IRS or state uh, attorney offices uh, solicitation guidelines, options, how to solicit funds, donors, and then at the very end of a fundraiser or an event, you need to report to us on how it went and, and uh, what money was raised and what belongs in donation pile, what belongs in the payment pile. So we'll go ahead and talk about that at the, at the, towards the end of the presentation. First off, I just wanted to give an overall view. So the U Giving USA I get, puts out this great book every year, and this is a, a pie chart from that book, and it's the Annual Report on Philanthropy, and this in particular is for the year 2012. And it really shows that the donations that come into nonprofits are from individuals, 72%. A lot of people think they can get the big money from foundational grants or private foundation grants uh, or sponsorships from corporations or even government grants, but really the, the bulk of the funds that are programmed underneath UCP or any really any nonprofit in the United States comes from individual donations. Um, and while we're talking about an event or fundraiser, you can use that event or fundraiser to cultivate that donor relationship. Or perhaps one year you'll get a hundred dollars, but because you invite them back to an event or you send them letters or newsletters or updates, you'll be able to cultivate that cultivate that relationship and maybe they'll give more money the next year. So I just wanted to show everyone here that the bulk of the donations that they're going to get, again, are from individuals. So there's a number of reasons why a program or any nonprofit would hold a fundraiser or an event. The first being to educate the public on your program's mission and activities. Holding an event or fundraiser, you're able to interact with constituents or members of the public so that they have a better understanding of what your program does, how it operates, who's in charge of the program, um, key staff members, where it's located, what it does, any kind of outreach it does in the community, and then engage those constituents 
in programs and VIC activities. Um, an example of this would be if your program was to hold a 5K or a run or something similar to that, whereas the individual would be engaged in that actual uh, event, and then perhaps you can cultivate that relationship, and perhaps they can then help with, let's say, a river cleanup or something along those lines, as well as raise awareness of the program's need. So uh, holding a, an event or fundraiser, um, you're typically going to seek donations, even if it's just an event and you're just uh, perhaps holding, um, for example, a seminar on how to avoid foreclosure for a home. You're still probably going to ask for donations, and you're also going to talk about your program needs. You could talk about perhaps that the program needs volunteers, or the program needs to have individuals that are willing to donate their, their time and effort in the space of, let's say, a, a web design or perhaps they need somebody with help with the accounting background. Uh, you're also able to bring up information about how the program is funding-wise. And again, you could talk about this is the X number of dollars needed for this year, and this is the, the deficit to meet that. So you could talk about how we're going to try and raise those funds, as well as the program's needs in regard to, let's say, non-cash gifts. You could talk about how we need to take in backpacks for the next school year, or pencils, or clothing items, shoes, uh, school uniforms. Depending on the program's mission, you could then talk about what it needs in order to fulfill it. And another, and a final reason that a program would hold an event or fundraiser would be to ensure the program's longevity. And what that means is that by that interaction with the constituents and, and the public, you're able to show its the program's necessity in being in that field and, and helping those individuals, as well as raising the funds needed in order to operate. So planning a fundraiser or an event can be a difficult process. Um, many of our programs come to us with little to, to no experience in event planning. So it, it, is, it is a process that you do have to develop over time. Uh, uh, and the majority of our programs that come to us um, are grassroots, and they don't have the funds necessary to, to immediately start operating. So they do have to start with their fundraising activities. Some of our programs choose to go ahead and do one yearly uh, golf tournament, and they find it very beneficial, especially after the first couple years. After they do it a number of times, it gets easier and easier. But again, that first time, it, it is difficult because you don't know what to expect. So that's why we're here to help, although um, the staff here won't be able to really plan the event for you. We could help you with guidelines or past experience that we've dealt with our, our other program managers, and, and we are here to help. Uh, and as much as I would love to be able to tell you that I could plan the event for you, we just don't have the, the staff necessary to dedicate to that experience. So we do have a fundraising event policy. It's available on our website underneath the Forms and Policy tab. And there it's going to detail what program can and cannot do, what it needs to have on its marketing materials. And these are things that we're going to talk about later on in the, in the presentation. Uh, but one of the major things that we require is that a program submit a fundraising and event approval form. And basically it's a standardized form that we use to collect information or data points about what the program intends to do how it intends to do it, what funds are being raised, where the, the event is being held, uh, any, any additional licenses or registrations are necessary. And we use that information both in our approval of the event, but in also of our, our 990 uh, to the annual report that we put out. So the form would need to be completed and, and submitted to UCP uh, 30 days in advance to the actual um, event or fundraiser. And again, it's going to include information about the event, and it's going to include a budget. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that later on in the presentation of, about what information you should include on a budget. And it inquires about, again, additional licenses, if sales tax is necessary. Um, and the reason why we ask about sales tax is that generally, and again, this is just a generalization, most states don't require the collection of sales tax if the event is held over a finite amount of time for example, one to two days. But if the program is going to be fundraising over a length of time, 
then sales tax is an issue that we need to look into. And each state is different. And um, based on past experience, it is difficult to get the sale of items approved, especially if we're going to be doing over time, just because the sales tax issue is, is, is very cumbersome. You have to report it, you have to pay it, you have to keep track of what is being sold and how much and the collection process. So it is a difficult issue to overcome if you do want to sell items through your program. And the final thing that we would need in addition to the approval form would be copies of the promotional materials. And I'm going to show you an example of what should be on that promotional material, uh, but we would want to see copies of it to make sure that those items are present. And this is just an example of a blank fundraising event approval form. We're going to need things like when the event's going to happen, the name of the event, where it's being held, location, and you're also going to indicate your program name and account number. And then you're going to describe the events and how it's related to your program's mission. Perhaps you made a website with the URL. The, you're also going to attach the budget. You're also going to inf provide information if there's any kind of auction items uh, that are going to be sold. And then any additional licenses or registrations that would be needed. So for insurance and waivers, uh, we do live in a world where insurance is a necessity. And one of the great things about UCP is that we are now having an umbrella policy for all of our programs. It starts June 1st and it goes until next year, so it's a one-year policy. Uh, this year's uh, insurance fee for 2014 is 360, and that will cover any event that the program holds. But if you do want more information about the insurance program, you could contact myself or take a look at our website. There's a, a list of frequently asked questions there and available. Um, some venues require that the, they are listed as an additional insured, and again, that wouldn't be an issue, and so you would just have to contact me so I can get that certificate issued and available to you. And the event insurance would cover things like general liability or accident. There are other items that would be needed, uh, particularly in a case where the event or fundraiser holds any kind of degree of danger. Uh, for example, if the program was to be uh, holding a 5K, you would need to have the participants sign the participant waiver and the volunteers hold the vol sign the volunteer waiver. And those are both available on our website underneath the forms and policies tab. And this ensures the safety of all event attendees. They need to understand what, what they're doing and how they're doing it. And again, an example of the 5K, uh, most municipalities require that uh, an ambulance or some kind of medical staff be present. So that would be something that they would have to look into in order to make sure that the safety of all event attendees is, is looked after. So there's various fundraising options. I know we talked earlier about individual donors, but you can also provide program services uh, in the case of a seminar for the program. Uh, again, an example I gave earlier would be a a uh, seminar on how to avoid foreclosure or educate constituents on how to avoid foreclosure. Events and fundraisers, grants, and, and a grant would be a, to a public charity, a private charity, or even the government. The government does have grants and that's through grants.gov. And corporate sponsorships. And, and especially in relation to events and fundraisers, you're going to be able to find corporate sponsors they're going to want to sponsor either a portion of the event or the event in general. Uh, for example, for the golf tournament, uh, you're going to be able to find corporate sponsors that would want to, say, sponsor any particular hole on that golf tournament. And here are a few examples of fundraisers and events. The picture here is from one of our actual programs. They used to hold symphony orchestras down in Florida. Uh, and in this particular picture it is from, I believe, June 2011. So fundraiser events examples, silent auctions, bake sales, raffles, but there are rules and regulations that are different in each state, so you would need to check with us first on that. Dinners, galas, golf tournaments, a big fundraiser for many of our programs, musical performance, festivals, any kind of an event or fundraiser that you're thinking of if it's not on a general list that we have, you can always contact us to get more information to see if it would be acceptable. 
So here uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more information about budgets and how to create a budget. So having a budget is an important part of holding a fundraiser. You want to know what your anticipated expenses are going to be as well as what your income is going to be in particular to a fundraiser. In an event where you're not really doing the event to hold, excuse me, to uh, raise funds, you're not going to worry so much to make sure that it's profitable, but you do want to be able to cover expenses. But if you are holding a fundraiser that it, its sole purpose is to raise funds for the program, you do want to make sure that the income from the event is beneficial and shows that it was successful. So examples of expenses, staff time, if you have admin staff or a program manager that you're that are going to be working on this event or running this event, you have to include that staff time because those individuals would need to get paid for their time. Uh, venue rental, in the case of the golf tournament, they need to pay green fees. Printing costs, and that's something that's pretty typical with any event or fundraiser. If you're going to have handouts for a seminar, or if you're going to print up signs for corporate sponsorships of the golf tournament holes. Travel expenses, so that's typically something that a lot of programs forget to include, especially if they're going to have um, speakers at an event that need to travel. Uh, for example, if you have a keynote speaker coming in from California and your program is in Virginia, you do need to account for that because you're going to want to be able to pay for their travel costs to get here, unless they're willing to do it pro bono, which is wonderful, but it, it, that, would be my, that might be a tough sell. And another expense would be media or a website. If you wanted to have a website designed solely for the fundraiser or event or a series of fundraisers or events, you're going to want to account for that cost, as well as any kind of media. Some programs have taken out news, uh, excuse me, articles or excuse me, advertisements in newspapers telling the public about their event. So there, there may be costs associated with that. And volunteers' expenses. So if you do have volunteers at your event, you typically want to be able to feed them, especially in the case of <coughs> excuse me, a 5K or a golf tournament. You're going to want to be able to pay for their lunch, make sure that they have adequate water and um, any kind of access for, let's say, if they had to travel any kind of distance for the program's event as opposed to just coming to the event. Let's say they had to cart the golf clubs or the t-shirts around, you'd want to be able to pay that expense for that volunteer. And then speaker fees. So many programs are able to find speakers that would do their event pro bono, which is wonderful. Uh, but if you're going to get a well-known keynote speaker or a well-known individual come speak at your event, there may be a, a nominal fee or a larger fee in order to pay that person for their time and effort. Um, hopefully you're going to be able to find some individuals that would do it for free, but you never know, so you do want to try and budget for that expense. Now income. There would be various sources for income, both for events and fundraisers. Uh, in the case of uh, both, there are ticket sales. And a ticket could uh, cover just the cost of attending the event. For example, just the cost of the lunch or just the cost of the green fees and and um, t-shirt. But then you can also build in a donation amount. For example, uh, a $250 golf tournament ticket would cover $150 worth of green fees and, and lunch and, and uh, golf cart rentals and t-shirts and then build in that $100 donation. And you can mark on that ticket that $150 is a payment and $100 is a donation. Sponsorships. And any kind of event or fundraiser you're going to hold, you can seek sponsors for it. You can seek sponsors for laners if you're having a conference. You could seek sponsors for the cost of the lunch. You could seek sponsors for, again, the, the golf, um, let's say, hole nine on the golf tournament. Some other programs choose to have some auctions, and I'll get into that a little bit more later on in the presentation. And so you're able to sell items that are either donated to the program or purchased by the program and then uh, raise funds that way. Just strict donations. Um, typically at an event you're going to ask at the end if anyone would like to donate or if you could pass a hat around. There's all kinds of options that you could do for an event. 
but a fundraiser if you're really going to try and get those donations in. And in-kind gifts, that would be the, the donation, let's say, of an auction item. That would be a non-cash gift. Let's say that they donated a piece of art, or perhaps they donated an object. They would be able to get a tax deduction for that, and that's through the IRS form 8283. And if you have any questions about non-cash gifts, you can always contact us here at our offices and speak with myself or with David Corey. He's our, our controller here. And so you'd want to take that as an income on that budget. So when you solicit funds, UCP is registered in every state that's required to do so. So that means that we are, our programs and UCP are able to fundraise in, in all states in the United States. And you're using UCP's 501c3 status so that you can offer your donors that tax deduction. If anyone was to require proof of UCP's 501c3 status, you can provide them with your IRS determination letter. It's available on our website underneath the financial and legal tab. A verification letter that you should have received when the program was opened. Well, we can also provide you with an updated one with perhaps a, a newer date on it. And you're also able to provide them with our state solicitation registration if required. So whenever you are making materials uh, for an event or fundraiser, there will need to be a statement on there. And here is a copy of that statement. Um, let's say ABC program is a fiscally sponsored charitable project of <coughs> excuse me, United Charitable Programs, a registered 501c3 public charity. Your gift is deeply appreciated and tax deductible as a charitable contribution to the full extent of the law. Please see UCP's website, unitedcp.org, to view all charitable, financial, solicitation, and registration documents. If necessary, you can also shorten that statement to just ABC program is a fiscally sponsored project, excuse me, charitable project of United Charitable Programs and registered 501c3 public charity. And you can also provide our TIN or tax identification number there. And for those of you that don't have that number, it is 20-428-6082. And under UCP's fiscal sponsorship, there's a couple of do's and don'ts. You always want to state that your program is a fiscal sponsored project of UCP. And again, there's that statement there. The ABC program is a fiscally sponsored project of United Charitable Programs, a registered 501c3 public charity, and there's that TIN, 20-428-6082. You should always communicate with the public that you are a program manager. Titles such as director or president are reserved for the UCP corporate staff here at our offices. You also want to make sure that you comply with all pertinent local, state, or federal regulations and laws pertaining to fundraising. And we take care of most of that through our, our approval process. But you know, there may be a local law that we aren't aware of, so that's why we ask if there's anything else that, that needs to be researched on that approval form. And you don't ever want to sign a contract or an agreement in the name of UCP or in the name of your program. So your program is not a legal entity, but rather a project of a legal entity, and that's United CP. And the only individuals that could sign a contract or agreement on behalf of UCP would be the corporate staff here, a director, the executive director, or the president. And you want to make sure that we're aware of the use of our TIN. Um, we do allow our programs to use it, but that's why we have that approval process in place so that we are aware of how it's being used. So here's a little bit more information about raising funds through sponsors. Your best sponsorships are going to come from sport, corporate sponsors. You do also are going to be able to find community business sponsorships, particularly if your program is holding a golf tournament. Maybe you could find a local um, sports store that would want to sponsor a particular hole or a portion of the event. Now, a lot of uh, individuals have questions about advertising versus sponsorship. So sponsorship is when funds are given. Um, let's take the case of when a hole is sponsored at an event. It's hole nine, and ABC <laughs> Corporation is sponsoring it. Uh, they're able to have that sign posted on that hole. They're perhaps able to have their, their sign in the gala event or uh, listed on the brochure. But you're not able to really give information, let's say, about what that, that corporation sells or 
their hours or buy one get one free because that's really considered advertising. So you're able to, to state that they are a generous sponsor. You can provide their logo, the name of the entity, and even a link to their website. But you don't want to advertise on behalf of a for-profit corporation or a company. You definitely want to just do nonprofit activities and state that they are a generous sponsor of your organization or of the event. So here's an example, generously sponsored by ABC Corporation. Uh, that would be something that would be acceptable, or visit ABC Corporation on Main Street for half off Tuesdays would be unacceptable. So uh, another question that we get is tax deduction versus value received. So in the case of the sponsorship, if there was any kind of benefit, um, monetary benefit, for example, if a, a sponsorship of $1,000 included two tickets that are worth $250 to an event, that means only $500 of that sponsorship would be considered tax deductible to the donor as opposed to that full price amount. Um, if you ever have any questions about that, I'd be happy to walk you through that because just having a sign up on event would not be really a, any kind of uh, value received there, but if they're getting any kind of monetary or tangible benefit, uh, again, a ticket to an event or um, uh, let's say they're also getting a, a t-shirt or a lanyard or anything that you could put a price on, you would need to deduct that amount from the tax deductible portion of the sponsorship. And here's an example. Just like I said a moment ago, for a $2,000 sponsorship, the, the sponsor also gets four entries that are valued at $250. So that means only $1,000 is tax deductible and the $1,000 is considered a payment. <coughs> Excuse me. So after you've done all this great work at your event or your fundraiser, you then need to send in your donations and payments to UCP. We have a donation and payment deposit form available on our website underneath, United, excuse me, underneath forms and policies. I'll show you an example of that, that deposit form in a moment, but it's going to include um, information about whether the check is considered a donation or a payment. Um, you're also going to let us know which, how, the portion of the tax deductibility, if there's a, let's say, a built-in donation to a payment for a ticket. You're going to inform us if the funds are considered a grant or an event or program service revenue. For credit card donations, you're able to allow your program manager, excuse me, your program donors to donate online, or we also have a credit card transaction form available on our website which has secure online access. So you, your, your donors don't have to worry about that donation going or their credit card information being improperly used. And you're also able to, you yourself as the program manager, log in and see what's been deposited, what's been taken for our fees, um, perhaps to make sure that a payment has been sent to a vendor, or perhaps a, a reimbursement check has been made to you. And a donation or a payment should be in the name of the program or United Charitable Programs or a combination of the two. Um, if it does say United Charitable Programs on the page of the order of, you would want to have the memo line as the program name just to make sure that we again use those funds and attri correctly attribute them to the program account. And here's an example of that program donation and payment deposit form. And the two most important parts is again the program name and the program number. So there's a couple of options out there that there are different rules and regulations in each state. <clears throat> Prizes. So if it was an individual to, was, was to receive a prize from an event, uh, typically that prize is considered taxable income and we would need to receive a W-9 from that individual and we would um, have to issue them a 1099 at the end of the year. So if they received a non-monetary prize, uh, perhaps in an extreme case a car, or if they received cash, again, that would be considered taxable income and we would have to issue them a 1099. So anytime you're going to have any kind of prize, you will need to talk to us first to make sure that you know that you need to collect that signed W-9 and then we will need to report that income correctly to the IRS and to the winner. Gambling. There are a couple of different options for gambling. Um, there are state restrictions <coughs> in various states that don't allow it. 
Some states require that you have to be a nonprofit, which is good for us because our programs are nonprofits. But there may be different solicitation or registration guidelines for that. And examples of gambling would be a bingo or a raffle or a casino night. Uh, typically a door prize or if there are tickets just sold at the event, we don't have to worry necessarily about any kind of gambling legislation or laws because they're just sold to a finite amount of people at a certain event, not sold over time. And it's not really considered gambling in all states. But again, these are things that we'd have to take a look at for your particular event. So when you sell items. Um, sales tax, like I said earlier, it, it is a, it's a bit of a hurdle. Um, many of our programs see it as a great way to raise funds. But anytime you're going to sell items over a length of time, you do have to worry about sales tax. And that includes online sales. So if, if you wanted to perhaps create a book and sell that book uh, when you go out and you speak to people or sell it at a, um, online, you do have to worry about sales tax. Um, our programs have found great options through Amazon or if they wanted to sell um, items with their program's logo on it, like mugs or t-shirts or aprons or really anything, um, we have found great options where they could do so and we don't have to worry about sales tax because they're, they're handled by that third-party vendor, Amazon.com or Cafe Press or uh, other vendors similar to that. When you sell items at an event or fundraiser, uh, generally, and again, like I said earlier, this is just generalization, you don't have to worry about sales tax because it's a finite amount of time, either a day or two, where the items are going to be sold. But those items that are going to be sold do need to have the program's logo and name on them in order to fall within that guideline. Now, when you provide a gift with a donation, the value of the gift needs to be very, very, very minor excuse me, in comparison to the gift amount. For example, when you make a donation to a charity and you receive, uh, excuse me, uh, let's say a hundred dollar donation to a charity and you receive a pen, that pen is probably valued at a dollar or two dollars and it's very, very small or minor in comparison to the amount of the donation. And the IRS uses the, the term inconsequential. Uh, the benefit is inconsequential in comparison to the donation amount. So when you're determining your ticket price, you can either just charge the value of the ticket or you could add a donation amount to that ticket. And that would be the total ticket price. Many of our programs choose to build in a donation amount and that you want to indicate on that ticket $100 payment, $50 donation amount, or, or, or what, however you wanted to work that out. And they could use that and, remind, and it would remind them that that portion is tax deductible for their taxes at the end of the year. So the, the value of the ticket would be considered a payment and the donation amount, the additional amount on top of that ticket price or the value of the ticket would be tax deductible. And you'd want to have that statement that shows your payment of $50 includes dinner value at $25 and results in tax deductible gift of $25. Or it could just simply state total value $250, $100 tax deductible donation, $150 payment price. So a lot of our programs choose to also do some auctions at their galas or events. And there, there are a couple of things you do need to know. So let's say an item was donated and the value of the item is $500. That is considered the fair market value or FMV of the item. And that portion is not tax deductible. That's what's going to be considered the payment. Any amount over the fair market value is considered tax deductible. So let's say that auction item was, was set out and it was purchased for $750. Or, let's just use this. A pair of earrings was valued at $100 was purchased for $200. Therefore, $100 is considered a payment and $100 is considered a donation. No, that would be tax deductible to the donor. So online registration for an event or fundraiser, we do have a great option that I'm going to show you an example of in a moment, and that's the Karma 401 Powered UCP Fund Org. You're also able to have donations made directly through your program's uh, basic donation page on our website, and that's through registration factor. There are other options out there like Network for Good or CrowdRise, but anytime you get into those types of organizations, there are going to be additional fees on top of UCP's admin fee. So you want to take a look at what they're offering, um, what the fees are going to be, 
uh, in the case of CrowdRise. I believe we recently did a, a, a research into it and found that only 80% of the, the funds or less than 80% of the funds are actually received by the program. So it's, you do want to check with us first because we're going to take a look at that to make sure, number one, that it is possible that our programs use that type of fundraising vehicle, and number two, that you're not going to be spending most of the money on fees. So here is the homepage of ucpfund.org, and that's powered by Karma Forum 1. It's a crowdsource or peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page. Um, you can receive registrations for events. You can re receive direct donations. Uh, you can also have listings for sponsorships, let's say gold sponsorship level, silver sponsorship level, bronze. Uh, you're able to have individuals go and set up their own team for fundraising. For example, at that 5K, if a runner wanted to have uh, individuals be able to donate uh, to support their 5K or their run, they could set up a, a fundraising team. And they, it is a great option for our programs. We're currently in beta testing, so we're still working on a few bugs, but we've already raised over $100,000, and we just started late last year on it. Uh, we have a number of programs that are using it to great advantage. In particular, the first one there, Maisha Means Life, uh, excuse me, Maisha. They recently had an event and sold the tickets through the registration page on ucpfund.org and they were able to reach a lot of individuals, and I believe they raised more this year than last. And if you're interested in setting up a microsite, and that's what these, these little mini pages, the first three right there, Maisha Means Life, Yachty Global, and Meant to Live, those are microsites for that program. If you're interested in setting up a microsite, you should contact Stephanie, the moderator on this webinar, and her email is stephanie at unitedcp.org and she can get more information from you and go ahead and set up that microsite and also give you support on how to set up the microsite, what information is needed, where to put pictures, and, or provide a picture for her to put up on there for you. So you're able to um, also receive a free website from UCP. Typically the program name is going to be in the URL, for example, http uh, colon slash slash program name unitedcp.org, and those are websites provided through Google. They are basic pages, but they are free nonetheless. If you're interested in a more robust page, you can always find a web developer or a web hosting that would then set that up for you. There would be additional cost to that. We do have that secure online donation link, a basic page on our website. Um, if you wanted to see your program's particular basic donation page, you would just click on Donate to a Program, put in the program's name in the search parameters, and click Enter, and you're able to see that page. You're able to um, access your online program's account. You would go to unitedcp.org and click on uh, Program Login, enter in your, your login and your password, and then be able to see what's actually in the account at that time. What's been posted, what's been deducted for our fees, what's been paid to a vendor, what's been sent out as a reimbursement to you. And you're also able to access all of our operational forms and policies and procedures. Um, the main place that many of our programs go are the forms and policies tab on our website. And here is that program login. It's at the top of the main menu. And then if you wanted to look at your donation page, it's the third one down, Donate to Programs. So you always want to cultivate that relationship with that donor. You want to be able to provide them with a donation receipt if necessary. UCP, it sends out donation receipts to donors of uh, 250 or more, and that's mandated by the IRS. But underneath that amount, we always recommend that you send a thank you letter. And we have a sample uh, template on our website that you could use, or you could create your own. And just take, let us take a look at it at the, after you've created it. And like we spoke about earlier, most of the donations that come to programs are from individuals. So you definitely want to cultivate that relationship. And you're also going to want to cultivate community relationships. Perhaps you'll be able to get a reduced price on a venue, or perhaps even have use it for free. And like I mentioned earlier, USB does send that tax receipt for donations of 250 or more. And you can use that sample donation letter on our website if it's under that amount. So after you've had that successful event, you want to report to us on that success. You're going to provide information about donors, the payment amount versus donation amount. 
information about sponsors. Uh, perhaps if they received any kind of benefit or a value in addition to their sponsorship, you want to tell us about that amount, and therefore we can determine what's tax deductible and what's considered a payment. Provide us with pictures. We have an annual report that we put out every year, and we definitely want to include pictures of your program and its successful events in it. You also want to tell us about any successes and challenges that you had. Um, challenges in particular to make sure that uh, any other program that perhaps wanted to do a similar event, we would know about and say, oh, we want to warn you about X, Y, Z. Or one of our programs found it was very successful if they did this. So um, as each of our programs go through these events or fundraisers, that, that kind of institutional knowledge about how to hold them and what's the best practices just grows and grows and grows. And then you'd also want to request payment for reimbursement uh, for expenses, payment to a speaker, reimbursement for their travel expenses, perhaps you outlaid the cost of the printing, you could then get reimbursed from the income from that event. And a quick overview on how to request funds uh, for a payment or a reimbursement. We have disbursement request forms on our website, and it's going to also include activity codes on that form. So each individual expense is going to have a particular activity code. In the case of uh, printing, that code is 5011-5011. And the form does include uh, the majority of the activity codes, but there are additional ones. And we have activity code definitions on our website. There are processing and delivery options. Most of our program, uh, our, excuse me, all of our um, disbursement request forms are processed within three to five business days. However, if you want a faster processing, or if you wanted that item delivered faster, there are additional options to that. The disbursement form can also be used to pay taxable income for services. And there's additional required documentation for that, a W-9 and an invoice. But anytime you're paying um, an expense or getting reimbursed, you do want to include a receipt or invoice. And also indicate the justification. So you want to tell us why this expense or why this uh, payment was necessary. Here's a quick example of our disbursement request form. You're going to tell us your program name and account number, and also who we're paying and why we're paying that uh, individual, where it is in the check, the amount, the justification, or if there's anything you'd like placed on the memo of that check. And you're ready to go. So that was a, a quick overview about how to hold a, a fundraiser or an event of an EPCP and a number of items that our programs have found beneficial to know, a quick guide on that. Um, again, my name is Katie Kern. I'm the Director of Program Administration. My number is 703-538-8867. That's the direct line to my office. And my email address is katie, K-A-T-I-E, at unitedcp.org. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie now, and she's going to let us know about the questions that our programs had with all the attendees. Stephanie? Thank you so much for that presentation, Katie. Uh, we do have a few questions here, um, and uh, attendees are still welcome to send them in, and we can try to answer as many as we can um, with the time we have left today. Let's see. Our first question is, are tickets to an event tax deductible? Well, the, the general answer is no, uh, but a portion of a ticket price can be tax deductible. And the reason why it's not tax deductible is uh, the entire price is not tax deductible is because there's a benefit that the individual that's attending the event is receiving. In the case of a gala, they're receiving dinner. Or in the case of a golf tournament, they're receiving the green fees and the, the, the ability to play on the, on the field. I'm sorry, on the course. So generally, the payment, for, excuse me, the ticket price is not tax deductible unless there's a portion that's built in, for example, $100 is considered a, tax, uh, a payment and $50 is considered a donation. Okay. Um, next question is, what if we collect cash donations during our fundraising event? Can we just mail that in to UCP? That's a great question. That's a question I get quite often. Um, so you don't really ever want to send any kind of cash in the mail. So if you do receive cash donations, let's say you put a bucket out at an event or um, somebody hands you $100 during a fundraiser, you do want to convert that fund, those funds into a money order or a cashier's check, and then you want to mail that in to us. In the case of the bucket, you're going to want to indicate that it was an anonymous donation because there's lots of people just putting money in, perhaps change or, or 
a few dollars here or there, and we're not keeping track of who's making those donations. But if someone sends you a, a large amount, you do want to keep track of that because it gives you a large amount. In a case, let's say they gave you $100 or $250, you do want to collect that individual's information so that we can correctly attribute that donation to that person. Great. Um, next question is, how much time do you think is required to plan and promote a successful fundraising event? So typically our programs are going to be able to plan and promote an event within perhaps two or three months. So you don't want to start promoting an event too far in advance because then that program, I'm sorry, that event might get lost and people might not remember it and you might be wasting advertising dollars or promotional efforts on a fundraiser that people aren't going to remember in a couple months. So you do want to, you know, perhaps send a save the date or notify individuals in a e-newsletter that there's an upcoming event, but you're not going to really want to start focusing your efforts on promoting that event until closer to it. And planning an event, it really depends on the complexity or what you intend to do. Um, a, a seminar that you want to just educate the public about, um, for the example I used earlier, how to avoid foreclosure. Uh, it's not going to be as difficult to plan as, say, a golf tournament where you have to rent out the golf uh, course, plan for the catering, plan for speakers perhaps at the gala after the golf tournament, uh, plan on getting sponsors for the different holes. So it really depends on the complexity of the event as well as what you intend to do and how you intend to do it. Uh, next question. Is there a template or something available that I can use when trying to scout for corporate sponsors? No, there is no template for scouting corporate sponsors. Um, my recommendation would be to find corporate sponsors in your particular community first. Um, they also might be able to give recommendations or referrals on other entities they think might also want to benefit your organization. Um, for example, if you have a animal rescue program, perhaps start with vet hospitals or pet food stores or training centers for pets. Find sponsors that are going to be interested in what you do as well as the people that you work with uh, because they're going to like it that they're being noticed in the community as supporting an animal welfare, welfare organization, especially since the people that are usually involved with animal welfare also for animals themselves and may then shop at their store. So my first recommendation would be to find entities that would uh, perhaps have a common interest in your program uh, and then go from there. Okay. Let's see here. And will this webinar be available? Yes, this webinar is going to be um, uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, and will be available to view um, in next week's newsletter. So just keep an eye out for that, um, and then and then you're welcome to uh, view this this webinar. It's been recorded today. All right. So it looks like that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, I just want to thank Katie for taking the time out of her day uh, to give this presentation. And again, if you have any questions, you can contact. Um, Katie or myself, Katie at unitedcp.org, or me, Stephanie at unitedcp.org. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.